So good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, Wednesday in Pittsburgh, and I believe we might be getting the first real snow of the season. I'm thrilled to be here as hump day. And I know many people are trying to figure out how to get into the right holiday spirits, given everything going on in our world. So hopefully you're all staying safe and sound, and there's no need for you to really go out too much other than to buy bread. So this is Audrey, and I'm the president and CEO of the Pittsburgh Tech Council. Jonathan Kirsting is with us as always. He is the vice president of media and marketing and storytelling. He's going to keep his eye on the chat. Thanks to Huntington Bank for the work that they've been doing with us and supporting us. And uh, if there is another PPP version that's coming out, I'm sure that we'll hear about that over the next week. And Huntington Bank will be pretty active in making sure that our members get what they need in terms of the support. I also want to give a shout out and recognition to 40 by 80, which is a wholly owned um, subsidiary of the Pittsburgh Tech Council. And our focus there is to make sure that we support entrepreneurship and workforce development across the region of southwestern Pennsylvania. We've muted your mics, but that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. We would like you to participate in our chat session. This is not an opportunity to sell your wares. This is an opportunity for you to focus on our guest. And our guest today is, I will introduce Aaron Watson in one moment, but before we go into today's program, I would like to give an acknowledgement of today's program's executive producer, and that is Jamal Bigstaff. And let me tell you about Jamal. Jamal is a high school senior from Nazareth Prep who is in his third year of interning with us at the Tech Council, which involves one day a week of on-site and or obviously in virtual, as today's case is, with our staff. Jamal not only developed the concept for today's program, but also secured our speaker for the day. And we're looking forward to having Jamal produce more business as usual sessions for us, and perhaps someday taking my chair to co-host his own session. So thank you, Jamal. And I'm gonna, and Jamal, we'll bring Jamal to the forefront in a few minutes as we do a little bit of a dive into our questions. So now I wanna jump in with our fun and esteemed and creative guest, and that is Aaron Watson from Piper Creative. I believe he runs Piper Creative, if that's correct. I would call you the CEO, and he founded it. But we're going to bring him to the forefront. And I, before we start, Aaron, first of all, thanks for taking the time with us. I know that you're always busy and running around doing amazing things and, and telling your own stories and stories of other people. And uh, you've actually helped us at the Tech Council and many of our members. So first, I want to start and just say, how are you? How are you doing through this process? And tell us why and when you started Piper Creative. Of course, yeah. Um, all things considered, I'm doing really well. Um, I think that for me, 2020 has been uh, mostly a, a reflection on how blessed I am and how many challenges other people have had to face through this. And uh, so I, I have, you know, not in any sort of like particular practice, but it's very easy for me to reflect on how many things I have to be grateful for in the face of such a uh, challenging times for so many. Um, I started Piper, uh, it'll be three years ago in February. Wow. And the idea was um, this epiphany that companies were gonna need to create a whole lot more content for digital platforms and they weren't gonna know how to do it. Sure, some companies have the natural media capacity, they have the interest, they have the gear, they have the person and they wanna make that investment. But a lot of firms were not gonna be able to uh, produce enough podcasts, put enough videos on YouTube, sure. um, you know, have, have the ability to shift from platform to platform as the uh, platform du jour tends to change. And so I uh, pitched my eventual co-founder, Hannah Phillips, um, on the concept of being a company that I said vlogs for other companies and we're going to vlog ourselves along the way. So what that's turned into is an agency where we help our clients, like I said, um, show up really well on YouTube, really well in a podcast format, really well on LinkedIn. Uh, and we're kind of developing services around vertical video, short form, like TikTok and Instagram reels and dub smash and platforms like that. 
Um, but simultaneously, we're doing that every single week ourselves. So we publish a new podcast episode every week. We publish uh, five videos a week to YouTube. We publish daily to LinkedIn. We publish daily to Instagram. And what that uh, then allows is we can learn through doing ourselves and transfer that to our clients. And, and you know, that, that was really the big opportunity that I saw as I looked around, I surveyed the landscape and, you know, there, there's 20 year old agencies in town that have 11 subscribers on their YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just can't imagine not taking the second largest search engine on in the world seriously and calling yourself a marketing company. So that's been, that's been you know, the, the impetus behind our efforts. And uh, 2020 has been a big year of, of learning to that end. But haven't you seen the pace of change in terms of 2020 while you talk about reflection? What do you think in terms of the pace of change? So, so it, it's whiplash. It's whiplash for anyone. But for us, it was a little bit of, you know, we, we kind of thought that we were focusing on things that people were still waking up to. And after 2020, you just can't, um, you can't stay asleep to these things anymore. Like, you know, Brian, as we were emailing here, prepping for, uh, for the actual interview, I, I actually posted on LinkedIn yesterday about uh, this event that we were doing. And he was talking about how his household became a YouTube household. Right. And that's very natural to me. Like I've spent basically anything that wasn't like a Steelers game or an NBA game is time spent watching YouTube as opposed to watching linear TV. And that's the norm for anyone in my generation or to my junior. And so there's just a, an explosion to the adoption of these platforms. We've seen an enormous explosion of viewership on our own channels. We think partially because we've refined our techniques a little bit, partially just because that's where the appetite has been. Mm -hmm. But it is um, you know, just incredibly, it feels incredibly good to have actually like kind of been in the pocket in terms right. of like where the puck is going as opposed to watching the puck race away from you. Right, right, absolutely. So what do you think? So let's, let's now that you brought that up, what do you think for 2021 in terms I mean, of I, adoption and the appetite and television? Yeah, I, I think that it's negligent for any company with any marketing budget to not be spending time around a digital video strategy. If you have a very limited budget, then that probably means making a video within the editing suite of TikTok, which is literally free. Mm -hmm. Or if you can have anything beyond that, you need to be owning key search terms on YouTube. So that when someone Googles you, you know, it, it, it's well past known now that SEO is a strategy you need to, get, need to get your site indexed so that someone right. puts in a Google search and your pages come up. And then maybe you're competing with a competitor uh, by, you know, putting your uh, company when someone searches their company's name in like a, a pay-per-click uh, function. But there needs to be a similar consideration for the second largest search engine on the planet, YouTube, also owned by Google. Do you own basic keywords there. Do you, if someone is searching for you or something related to what you do, do you have a chance of showing up? And if you don't, it is negligent marketing to not address it. And, but so talk, but talk a little bit about the appetite shift. Do you think it's because the behavioral shift that you're seeing, what do you attribute that to? Uh, so I, I think a part of that is honestly not being in the office and not having someone over your shoulder. Like we saw a ton of uh, consumption of LinkedIn in 2018 and 2019 because it was the only platform that was socially acceptable to have open on your screen while you were in the office and someone's looking over your shoulder like, oh, they're on LinkedIn. They're still like doing something. But no one thinks that way if you're on Instagram or if you're on YouTube or one of these platforms. But now in a remote environment, the reality is, is that no one works eight uninterrupted, uh, just robotic hours. We are not machines, we are humans. We need to decompress, we need to take some time. We need to go look up a how-to video or we just need to see some you know, puppies running around to like refresh ourselves before we take on the rest of the day. And so in some capacity, the ability to have those kind of natural bite-sized moments of consumption throughout the day without some sort of uh, person over the shoulder looking at what you're doing has enabled people to embrace that even further. And similarly, you know, TikTok, the, the TikTok thing is more a uh, kind of natural iteration of social networking algorithms. So there's a, a fantastic uh, post by Kevin Kwok about how quickly their feed learns exactly what it is that you want to watch and how quickly they're able to fill 
um, their machine learning algorithm with each individual user's preferences, which is really the key to making a feed engaging. But it's the same type of thing where we find ourselves with more downtime. We find ourselves, frankly, looking more to escape, needing to take a breath from either the election or the pandemic or whatever other thing may be affecting you this year and wanting to get away from it. And those are the two best places to do it on demand. Well, let's bring Jamal on real quick. So Jamal, I mentioned to everyone about Jamal Bigstaff. He's been with us three years. He is at Nazareth Prep and uh, he, he kicks our butt quite often. We learn a lot from Jamal. So Jamal, you want to pipe in and ask a question? I meant, do you like the way I said that? Pipe in, pipe in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it, I like it. So yeah, I just got it. Hey Jamal, what, you want to ask Aaron the question? Yeah, so. TikTok and Instagram Reels have become really popular among young people. How are businesses leveraging these technologies? Yeah, I mean, the starting point is, is the savvy businesses are realizing that it's not just young people. It's uh, 2.6 billion worldwide downloads of the TikTok app. There's more than two point, if you just think of a percentage of humans on earth, that's way beyond young people. That's now uh, nearly a majority of, of adult humans on the planet. Um, mm -hmm. And so recognizing from a starting point that this is just the latest iteration on what storytelling looks like. Yes, we can all, you know, love a really highly produced 60 minute documentary. We can love our two hour crazy long podcast interview. Um, those are forms of consumption that we've all adopted and integrated with different digital uh, platforms. But the reality is, is that, that, that those bite-sized chunks, those are very quick decisions, does this hook me in the first one, three, five seconds, is how most content is actually consumed. When you're scrolling through the feed, um, when you're trying to be an engaging storyteller, that is the format that people are used to consuming. And so some companies are specifically operating there and growing. We've seen enormous uh, restaurants, coaches, consultants, but you know, mechanics, people that work in the physical world. Um, the, the, the twin of TikTok, Daoyin in, in China, is a social commerce app. So if you in any way, shape or form resonate with being in retail, you need to recognize that the, the underpinnings for social commerce that is already prevalent in the second largest economy on earth is coming here. The Instagram redesign, the centrality that they're placing reels is them preparing for the same type of super app where commerce from point A all the way to final transaction happens within one single app. They're laying the groundwork for that now. And if you're not prepared to sell in that environment, what that looks like is if you're, if you're an apple farmer, what that looks like in China is you walk out to the apple farm, you point to the fresh apple on the tree and you say, you want to buy this apple? And then right there in app purchase can be completed. And you can see the, the application of that for anything that's sold. That's retail. That is enormous. Mm -hmm. If you aren't thinking in those terms, if you aren't preparing your business to sell in that type of environment, then you're going to miss the boat. And so, 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 so the business application is you have to get comfortable. You have to get uncomfortable with it because it's new and it's foreign and it's difficult at first, but you have to get uncomfortable so that you can become comfortable because at some point it's going to be the cost to do business. No, I totally, I totally agree with you. And I think I see people skipping this chapter. They think they can skip this chapter. And just like much of innovation, people hold on to things that they just are, are real familiar. And that's and a really good example. You have questions here, Aaron. So there's some questions. I don't know if Jonathan, I can't see Jonathan. Yeah. No, Great questions here. A whole bunch of questions that I'd really like um, you to answer. Absolutely. Aaron, thanks for joining us today. It's always great getting your insight. It keeps us sharp at the Tech Council as well, too. So um, uh, Leslie June wants to know, um, do you think or have evidence that baby that the uh, baby boomer segment is uh, reaching, is, is searching YouTube? In any significant way, if uh, one's clients are 40 and older, like myself, is YouTube a place where they go regularly? Absolutely. So the starting point is, is like I said at the beginning, Google owns YouTube. So literally on our own channels, uh, on, on Hyper's own channel, and I've got the number up here, I, I don't want to mess it up. 45% of our views of our YouTube channel come via Google search. So what's happening is someone's typing into the search bar in Google and a YouTube video is getting surfaced as one of the top results. So that's actually driving views for us 
right now today. And every, I think we can agree, everyone uses Google search. So, there, so right there off the bat is one instance where you're reaching that older potential audience. Even further um, uh, on, a, on a YouTube uh, advertising, that's a little 202, but the advertising tool is uh, used for remarketing to anyone making any query. So we're working with someone right now that's selling a software. And when people search in need of a certain type of software, we are remarketing to them a specific ad just because they've made that query. So similarly, that is not that is age agnostic, um, and I don't have the the actual like tangible like what percentage of people over a specific age are using the YouTube. But in the reports that I've seen, I have absolutely no doubts. In the same way that we have no doubts that there are people over the age of forty on Facebook, I would imagine that a very similar appetite for content is happening on YouTube, maybe not as consistent, consistently of a habit, but it is without of a shadow of a doubt there. Well, yeah. I'm way over 40 and I definitely am on uh, YouTube quite a bit. What we've noticed at the tech council, which is really cool is if you search business as usual with any of our guests, the first result is our YouTube video of that guest in the Google search result, which is right up to what right. you're saying right now. Yeah. Yep. So uh, Todd has been trolling your enter your uh, LinkedIn profile and wants to know. He says he says uh, he sees um I see your uh, your city with uh, this will be our finest hour as a backdrop. Uh, can you speak to what this means for you? Great question there, uh, Todd. Yeah. So that's a bit of a curveball. Um, I posted that right at the beginning of the pandemic, and that was taken from one of my absolute favorite writers on the internet by the name of Ben Hunt. Um, and and the, the framing was uh, from the very jump, he, he, was, he was so early to recognizing this, but we weren't getting real numbers from very early on. There was uh, gross misrepresentations about um, the, the, the risks and the pervasiveness of the virus. And the framework has to move to a, a wartime mentality. And, and what that really means is less about violence or aggression or hatred towards others, and more towards the way that in really difficult times, people rally around one another. They look out for their neighbor. Um, you know, for, for me and, and my fiance here, we, we live in a condo. That meant knowing that there's some other elderly people in the building and saying, hey, you need us to go get groceries. You need us to like run an errand for you because you're clearly more at risk. We're here for you. That means yeah, it's basic stuff like wearing a mask and being uh, vigilant and considerate of other people, um, but recognizing that as scary as it was, and it was scary in March, recognizing that at the same time, this is when people get to show their deep character and their care for one another as humans. And that is what will make this our finest hour. It's our chance to show how great we really are because it can only be demonstrated in the difficult times. You're yeah. so wise, yeah. you're so That's wise. Nice. And Aaron, just for everyone to know, Aaron has helped us at the Tech Council. So if you can't tell his enthusiasm and, and his smarts about all of this, he, he really cares. He's really got a huge amount of compassion and uh, he is not afraid to say what he thinks as you, can, as you can see here. So a whole bunch of wisdom. So Jonathan, there's still some more. A few more here. Yeah, you're getting some good comments here, Aaron, in the uh, questions in the uh, chat here. So. Um, so a vendor right wants to know, could you speak to the need for companies to have both a web and mobile app presence if they're looking to sell to the general public? So I don't have a definitive view on this, but I will uh, regurgitate something that someone much smarter once said to me, um, a, a founder of a company that used to be the VP, VP of sales for, um, he just his name is Jeremy Kaufman, one of the absolute smartest dudes that I've ever come into contact with. And what he basically said was, why do I need an app? And, and that was basically framed as, sure, it's nice. Sure, yes, it's, it's good. And we can completely understand why um, some of the biggest companies in the world have their own apps and, and have built an enormous business off of that. But there's a pretty big hurdle to downloading a new app, at least for me and I think for a lot of people. And so everything that he built, knowing that we were a small startup, we weren't the most funded. We weren't the, you know, most uh, technologically sophisticated. We were, we're kind of playing catch up and we were, we're working with less resources um, was to make everything uh, web-based so that you could drop a link to someone and they could operate with it. You had less lock-in, you had less control of that end consumer, uh, but it was kind of a, a easier point of entry for most people to the technology that you're building. So in general, and, and we've actually, you know, helped a couple companies that were kind of just getting off the ground. We've kind of push them away from immediately building an app because you need one that works on iOS, you need one that 
that works with Android and there's maintenance costs and there's changes. When you constrain it to being web-based, you have a greater likelihood of keeping those initial startup costs constrained. And then you can always build into those other formats in the future. So let me, let's me let jump into this. We, we really love the banter that you created. Talk about sort of like branding, but there, but there, there was more to it than this. So we enjoyed the banter that you had with Darren Grove, who is the founder of TrueFit during the run up to our Tech 50 event. But talk to us about what you describe as collabs. Yeah, so, so to quickly, anyone who might not be familiar, uh, both Darren and I were finalists, or uh, both Darren's company TrueFit and my company Piper were finalists for Solution Provider of the Year. Um, this was the second year in the ro uh, a row that we were lucky enough to be nominated for that. And last year we did uh, basically like fight posters. So we were like facing right. off on one, an one another the way that uh, like boxers might. And this year what we did is we declared meme war on one another, which was if you think of famous fight scenes like uh, Captain America versus Iron Man, uh, or you know a battle scene from Game of Thrones or something, we basically stitched our heads on top of the respective characters and had that battle play out on LinkedIn as a kind of run up to um, a, a run up to the event. And the idea there is actually kind of it, it, it's collabs, which is recognizing that there's a there's a loyal group of people that love TrueFit, follow TrueFit, um, ride for TrueFit, and there's a group of people that are loyal to Piper, ride with Piper, and getting to cross pollinate those is an amazing audience building strategy that I've witnessed because we've done 450 podcast episodes and I've seen, you know, uh, employees and fans and followers from different companies that we've interviewed come and become part of the Piper audience. Um, and then the other element of that story is in the same way that I said that the storytelling style of TikTok is something that folks need to learn. Yeah, there's the photo from uh, however long ago. Um, <laughs> the, the storytelling style of TikTok being something that will invade other platforms and kind of become just a, a, an internet native method of storytelling is memes. I mean, memes have been on the internet forever from, mm -hmm. from Reddit forums to uh, Twitter to, to everywhere, but you don't see it so much on LinkedIn. So really what we were doing, you know, we call ourselves creative. Creativity is very much, you know, taking ideas from one place and moving them to another. And really what we were doing is taking this idea of live action memes that we've seen, you know, folks from Barstool Sports use to declare war on, on one of their enemies du jour. And we did that playfully against another company here in, in Pittsburgh that frankly, I, I, I like Darren, we, you know, we've collaborated with TrueFit in the past, um, but that energy was something that, you know, we were able to instigate and create a little bit, even more excitement uh, about the Tech 50 Awards. It's so interesting because in many ways you both could be competitors. And so instead you're, you're flipping it. And that's something that I'm hoping that our listeners can really understand that you're flipping it and you're leaning into it. So. Talk about, are there any other examples of where we should be thinking about that and why that's so important in this day and age? Because I'm seeing more of that as a strategy. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the truth, is, the harsh truth of the digital age of the internet age is that there will be exceedingly large gains to an exceedingly shorter number of winners. That there's, there's a degree to which um, the, the winnings concentrate on a few players. And you see, you could talk about that in pop music. You could talk about that in tech. You could talk about that in almost any domain. Um, and so what that means is even companies or firms or teams that would have traditionally seemed large in any other point in history mm -hmm. need to hoover up. They need to assemble more partners and allies and squads um, in, in order to compete in today's day and age. And, and frankly, Piper, we're thinking about that all the time. Like, I think that there should be, um, like from a collaboration standpoint, there should be a Pittsburgh creator house where some of the biggest creators, and, and we know a, a fair number of them, get together and you know cross pollinate their audiences more aggressively. I think that from a small business standpoint, that used to look like your you know your networking lunch, where it was the accountant and the lawyer and the insurance agent all getting together and you know handing referrals back and forth. That's just an analog version of what I'm talking about. It, we were just adding the fact that yes, referrals are still a thing. Yes, you know, being able to, to create those uh, dots and connect them is still a thing. But at the same time, creating content together is also a very viable uh, avenue to the same idea. 
Well, you know, there, there, there is, I do believe, and I don't know whether you believe this, but is there, is there, are there any questions first before I jump into this, Jonathan? Any questions or comments? Yes, we have one that came in here. Um, basically wants to know, Aaron, um, can you speak to the importance of consistency and patience when building a brand, especially online? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been doing my show for four and a half years. Um, we've been doing the YouTube, the, the company here for coming up on three years. Um, this was far and away our best year. It, it, it's clearly compounding. I was talking about it with someone last night. It, we can feel it compounding. When you're right there, you can kind of see the compounding happen, but you're still in the early stages of that arc where it gets crazy and exponential way on down the line. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's brutal. Like, like I've, I've told this to, you know, people that were trying to get started or maybe in the early stages, I've, I've said this candidly, like I can remember wanting to quit the first year every other week because it wasn't growing. I thought it was gonna be Tim Ferriss mm -hmm. in like four weeks or something. And that obviously didn't occur, but that's, you know, that's, that's the, the naivete or the maybe delusion that you need in order to kind of get started to see that potential to be so entranced by it. Um, but the reality is, is that like, you know, the, the, it, it's a thousand small adjustments along the way. And the only way that you can get to the 711th is by getting to the 710th. And so, you know, we, we joke about it all the time where we'll look back on like the way we did the thumbnails on our YouTube channel two months ago and be like, man, what were we thinking? But we only were able to reach that point of realization by getting to that point two months ago. So I, that's the only way to do it. There is the, the overnight sensation thing is a myth. I can't tell you how many times podcast guests have told me that. I can't tell you how much just the data bears that out in terms of the blogger that posted every single day for 10 years. And then all of a sudden they're an overnight sensation. Right. It's just that's the way of the world. Pittsburgh. That's what I say about Pittsburgh. When they talk about autonomous vehicles, I'm like, yeah, that's a four decade overnight success, yeah. Exactly. They've been building Carnegie Mellon on uh, on autonomous trucks for four almost four decades. So right, yeah, okay, we just got the recognition. I'm going to jump into the last question, but I want to tell you, don't compare yourself to Tim Ferriss. He even gets drunk on the show, okay? Yeah. And uh, you know, I think that you're calibrating yourself differently, but I can see where you might use that as a benchmark. So let's. You like to talk about building ensemble brands. What does that mean, and why do you think that's so important? So the starting point that's important for that is, is uh, a piece by David Perel um, called Naked Brands. And basically it's this idea that the companies, the brands, uh, the firms that we really engage with uh, look very different than prior generations. Like we can think about uh, LeBron's production company or Serena Williams uh, investment firm. And I, I, it's not just sports, but this kind of like personality entity centric uh, type of brand that gets built and how that lends itself to behind the scenes. It lends itself to authenticity. It lends itself to a deep trust because you're hearing this person's voice articulate the idea or what they believe in. And one of the shortcomings I've actually, sp I, I got dinner with David and we spoke about this specific idea um, was one of the kind of fragilities of that model is that it is highly dependent on the individual. So to use the LeBron example, once again, um, you know, if he were to have some sort of devastating career injury or, you know, whatever reason, he just decides he doesn't want to be in the public eye anymore. And he doesn't want any sort of business entities. It, it would actually submarine his entire business platform that, you know, probably employs dozens of people and creates all sort of economic opportunity. And so how do you hedge that specific risk? And what we've come to, this is something that we uh, you know, we probably need to do like a trademark or something, but we start calling it an ensemble brand, which is if you think about um, the Kardashians or you think about uh, from a yesterday, from earlier in time, like the Friends show, where there was these very distinct collection of personalities. No one is a mirror image of one another and someone has their favorite and someone has their least favorite, but they interact with one another. And whether that's a reality show environment like the Kardashians or something more staged, uh, like friends, to, to use those easy examples, that is where you get an almost uh, limitless supply of potential narratives. And the way that's manifesting itself right now, most popularly, is in the different houses. So if you've seen um, like Hype House and these different TikTok house ideas, what is happening is all these disparate creators are coming together 
cross promoting one another and rising tide lifts all ships. They all see their platforms grow substantially. And there's actually a business model behind those houses where they turn into talent, ma uh, talent management. They uh, sign collective deals that everyone gets a cut of. And there's really cool kind of scalable ideas there. But if you think about that, once again, back to that idea of if it was the referral you know, group of, of, of 10 professionals in 10 different um, industries, that is really, or, or a law firm by itself and their different um, departments and their different specificities creating this picture of these different characters interacting with one another. So for example, you know, I, th this is, this seems asinine, but I like, um, you know, crunchy peanut butter. Hannah likes creamy peanut butter. That's my co-founder. And we'll have a debate about that. And that seems silly, or we'll debate like our favorite Christmas song over Christmas time. And that, that, in a vacuum seems silly. It's like, Aaron, I don't understand why that has anything to do with me selling more widgets or me getting more business. But the, the, the presupposition, the starting point for any sale is someone else's attention. You can't not sell, sell to someone if you don't have their attention first. And what we're talking about is on that arc of the sales process, that initial attention point what could potentially garner attention? No one wants to hear about the features of your thing for the 18th time. And you probably put yourself to sleep talking about it, if that's the only content that you ever make. But this is that well that you can go to to come up with the next piece of content that you might want to uh, create to fill the pipes and put out as much as we've put out over the last couple of years. It's, it's predicated on the ensemble idea. There isn't one star. There isn't one product that we talk through the features. There's a collection of characters. They bounce into one another. It's life. It's messy. And you allow that messiness to become different narratives. So we're, we're at the end of our show. I want to tell everyone, first, I want to give Jamal, thank you for having Aaron on the show and for joining us and being such a great intern. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I believe that we put out Piper Creative. You see it there. You can find him. He's easily accessible. And uh, you can see tomorrow we have a really another great guest, Jamola. He's the CEO and of uh, and Wool. Are they brothers? His father and son. The father and son. Yeah, oh, his, God, his son crazy. graduated CMU at that a is, very young age. That cool is stuff. way cool. So can everyone talk. can tell the kind of energy that Aaron has. He's passionate. He's smart. He's trying to kick us to the future. And he's no BS about it. Really appreciate, Aaron, your energy and your drive and all that you bring to this. It's something that uh, you know I deeply care about and making sure that we're at the precipice of all things. And I think you're right. 2021 is going to be insane in a really great way. Thank you for your reflections. Thank you for your compassion. So we will see all of you tomorrow. And uh, if you want, again, connect with Aaron directly, you won't regret it. Be good. Thank you, everyone.